as this creature dressed in a red jumpsuit carrying a pitchfork. And he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There are subtle ways the enemy works. So be on to him. Be on to the subtle ways that he works to crowd your life with noise and distractions, to steal from you precious time with Jesus, um, to kill your love for Jesus with all those distractions, and to just to destroy your life as a result of not having that connection with Jesus. So, again, he cannot steal your salvation. Your salvation is secure. But, oh, he can make us a frustrated, unfruitful, discouraged mess of a believer. You know, you are a child of the King, of the Lord God Most High, and we got to act like it. we got to start living like it. And so do the things that you see Jesus doing and modeling out for you to set that pace, dial down that noise, dial back all of those things that are grabbing, screaming, clawing for your attention, and get to a breathing room place that has a pace that's sane that will allow you to flourish and allow your intimacy with Jesus to grow, that you might know Jesus and love Jesus and follow Jesus all the days of your life. So let's pray before we get into our session and we'll get as much of this covered as we can. Father God, thank you again for such a day like today, just a day to be alive and to know you better, to know you more. God, I thank you for these women in this room. I thank you for the fact that they have chosen to worship you this morning by coming to Bible study. Not here for me, but here for you. Um, Their sheer presence here, their desire in opening up their Bible to study is worship because they've made you a priority. They've, They've put preeminence on their relationship with you. And today, as we just come gathered in this small room, Um, in this building in Dallas, Texas, you zeroed in and you have sought us out this morning, God, because we come worshiping you in our time together. I pray, Father, that you would speak to us in your word, your um, life-giving, God-breathed word, that you would do something in us today that so marks us and changes us that when we leave here today, we will not be the same women that we were when we walked in. We thank you, God, for your word. It is your word. So, Holy Spirit, you must be our teacher today. My words can't do anything to change anyone in here. And I pray that, as Paul prayed, God, that my words um, would not be filled with wise and persuasive and impressive explanations, but that they would just be a demonstration of your spirit so that the faith of the women gathered here and even mine would not rest on my words but on the power of your spirit in their life. I ask this in the strong and saving name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So open up your session notes to session four, and it's living a life of worship. That's what we want to talk about today, living a life of worship. And then open your Bible to John 4, and I'm going to read part of it to you again this morning. And um, it's a good thing to be in the Word of God. It's a good thing to be in the Word of God. I want to start in um, reading in, in John 19, but just to narrate a little bit to you again, this, this encounter that Jesus has with a woman from Samaria, which is halfway distance between um, uh, Jerusalem and Galilee, where, where uh, Judea and Galilee, where Jesus was traveling to. And it said that he had, in this, in this passage, he had to stop into, in Samaria. He had to go to Samaria. And we know from our previous lesson that he had a divine appointment and a divine encounter with this woman in Samaria. And this woman, as, we've, as we look at her life throughout the last uh, few weeks, we see that this woman um, had some ordinary circumstances that a lot of us could relate to. She was a woman who um, had had some heartache, some deep heartache, some deep loss in her life. Um, some uh, deep brokenness in her life. And so she, we know this because she came to this well to draw water at a very odd time of day when most women would not be coming to draw water. But she came there and she had an encounter with a man, but not just any man. She had an encounter with a Jewish rabbi. She could tell by the way he was dressed that Jesus was indeed a rabbi or a teacher. And it's referred to in the, 
in the Hebrew culture. And so she sees this rabbi, and the interesting thing, and that the, the John writes this in the text, um, Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. They considered them to be half-breeds. They considered them to be irreligious or sacrilegious because they didn't follow all of the Torah or the law. And so they were shunned greatly. In fact, Jews would go two days out of their way to just avoid, circumvent um, having to go through Samaria, which was a straight shot to Jerusalem. And so um, she comes to the well and she sees this man and she's carrying a water jar to get water for her daily needs. And the water jar could also represent just her own spiritual needs. So she sits down, he, Jesus sits down at this well and she makes her way up there. And you can imagine then knowing the context that Jews don't have any dealings with Samaritans, that it's probably a, a bit daunting for her to see a man there. And it's one of those situations where no one else is around. His disciples have gone to town to buy food. She makes her way up. I don't know if she came around a bend. I don't know if she came over a rise in the road and could see him in the distance. But in, 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 in any regard, there he is. I wonder if she just said to herself, oh, the heck with it. At this point, I could care less. I've been wounded and hurt by so many men. What's one more man going to do to me that hadn't already been done? Or if she thought for a minute I could turn and run. But I need this water. I'm that thirsty. I need this water, so I'm willing to just break uh, tradition. I'm willing to cross over some boundaries, just as, as Jesus had cro- crossed over some racial boundaries, some religious boundaries, some gender boundaries. I'm willing to cross this over because at this point I just don't care. I'm that thirsty for what I need in that well. And Jesus then asks her for a drink, and the conversation starts. And we go from a very simple ask to a very, very deep, intimate conversation about her life and someone she's willing to open up to probably for the very first time. But imagine how she felt shunned, um, turned away, unaccepted, hurt, offended, betrayed, just all of those things that she might have felt. He asks her about her husband and that's when she confesses that she does not have a husband. And he acknowledges, that's true, you've had five. And in fact, the man that you're living with isn't your husband. So imagine how she must have felt. And she quickly changes the conversation to religion. Now, we're, we're sometimes told, like, the things you don't want to talk about, especially at family gatherings like Thanksgiving, politics, sex, and religion. And so they pretty much cover all of it in here. So this is... That's why it's so intriguing to me as they cover all of the, tab- the social taboos, right? And so in verse 16, Jesus says, uh, Go call your husband and come here. Uh, the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You're right. And saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. The one you now have is not your husband. What you said is true. So she, in all of her uneasiness, now diverts, changes the subject completely, and says, Uh, in verse uh, 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where we are, where people are ought to worship. Now, this mountain, she's probably pointing with her hand, is, is Mount Gerizim that was right there in the distance. And that was where traditionally the Samaritans went to worship um, on that mountain. And so she's saying, Worship is that place over there. So our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship, where Jerusalem represented the temple, the temple of God. And that's where the temple was, and that's where all Jews would go um, for Passover and for high holy events to worship in the temple, to make sacrifices in the temple. So that's where they would go was to Jerusalem. So she's, she's pointing out, that worship is to take place somewhere. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. You say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. 
You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, little s, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. So right there she has confessed that she knows there is a Savior coming. She's, She's told him, she's acknowledged, you know, that she's a believer. But what she has her belief wrapped up in is a religious experience. And he's about to unpack for her a relationship, a relationship of depth and intimacy that she's not experienced before. So when he, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. And then Jesus says to her in verse 26, I who speak to you am he. So he reveals his biggest secret to her. The first time Jesus ever addresses that with any person, he's been asked before by his disciples and by other people who have said, are you the Messiah? Or tell us, are you the Messiah? And, and he does not answer anyone until this point. I, there's significance here, y'all. The first time Jesus admits, confesses, tells anyone that he is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, is to a woman. Outcast number one. A Samaritan woman. Outcast number two. She's an an educated woman. She's a woman who's lived a sinful life. All of these things make her just outcast. He didn't tell it to, he did not confess that to the religious elite. He didn't even confess it to his disciples at this point. But he shared this with a woman. One thing that has said here that is, I, I want to make a note now, it's not even in my notes, but it's, go back to where he says, uh, woman, a time is coming, believe me, the hour is coming when neither you will worship on, on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You will worship the Father. You will worship what you, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews, verse 23. But the hour is coming and is now even here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is seeking our worship. And God is seeking the kind of worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and truth. Part of what I believe took him to Samaria to meet this woman is he was seeking people to worship him in spirit and truth, true worshipers. And I want to unpack what that is for us, what that means for us. But he didn't just seek her out because she needed saving and she needed filling. He sought her out as a true worshiper. We will see in the last week of our study, and I hope you all will be here, that last week of our study that this woman did. She was a woman after God's own heart. And she took what he gave her at that well and she ran back to town and she became an evangelist. She could not hide what Jesus had done for her. She worshipped him in the way she exploded her life and what God had done in it to those people so that they could come know the hope of Christ that she knew, that she now knew for real. Okay, I'm going to pause. This is so random. Is this your, anybody's book? This, this is a, a notebook that has some notes in it um, that someone gave me last week. Okay, all right. I think you gave me the wrong notebook. Okay, all right. I have it. I'm just looking around. I'm thinking I forgot to do that. So um, sorry for those of you who are listening in. So when you hear the word worship, what does that mean to you? What does the word worship mean to you? Um, pick out some, some words. That, what comes to mind? Surrendering. Surrendering. Good. What else comes to mind when you think of worship? A connection, A connection with God. Obedience. Pardon? Obedience. Obedience. To, exalt. to exalt. Good. Yes. Anything else? Praise. Hmm? 
praise. Right. Praise is good. Okay, so worship for a lot of people can mean a lot of different things. And I think some of the most common things we think about when we worship is we go to church and we worship. We sing songs and we worship. Music is played and we worship. And so those things are all part of worship. Listening to pastor, pastor's teaching, that's worship. We're tuning our mind. We're tuning our ears. We're tuning our focus to, to what God is saying in his word as it's being taught to us so that we can know God better and respond to him more and take the lens of scripture then and see our life through the lens of scripture and find where things are not lining up and make that change and be filled with more of him. Does that make sense? And so that's all part of worship also. The word worship, and you'll look at this in your life work this week, the word worship um, comes from a Greek word that means to worship. It means to kiss, like a dog licking its master's hand. It means to bow down. It means to adore, to show respect or fall prostrate uh, uh, oneself before another. The ancient Orientals, had a way of worshiping where they would bow down with their forehead to the ground and they would blow kisses at the same time. That's, that's what worship was for them. Over the years, worship was then transformed from more of an outward gesture to an internal or inward attitude. And that is exactly what we see in Scripture. That's what Jesus is saying to the woman at the well. He's saying, worship... Religion, worship is not about where you go to worship or how you worship. There are traditions and different denominations and different um, bodies of believer within the body of Christ who all worship God, but they have different traditions within those churches. Worship is not a tradition. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is attributing, and you can write this down, worship is attributing supreme worth to God, who alone is worthy. Worship is attributing supreme worth, and someone said exalted. Worship is attributing supreme worth to God, who alone is worthy. It's making him the main thing. It's keeping the main thing the main thing in all things supreme worth to the only one who is worthy of it. Matt Redman is a, uh, a worship leader and songwriter, and uh, he, you may probably, the most famous of his songs, well-loved of his songs, is um, um, 10,000 Reasons, Bless the Lord, O My Soul, um, Worship his holy name. Bless the Lord on my soul. Um, you, you all know that song? Okay, so before he wrote that, he wrote a song called The Heart of Worship. And I've had the lyrics for you in your life work at the end of the, of the um, third day. But the story of how that song was written, I think, is quite marvelous. I'm going to just read to you, and this is from The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. And this is in a chapter on worship. And I've heard this story. I've heard Matt Redman tell this story. This is the concise version. And um, just think about how this would impact you. So Matt Redman is a worship leader in England, and he tells how his pastor taught his church the real meaning of worship. To show that worship is more than music, he banned all singing in their services for a period of time while they learned to worship in other ways. And I think it was maybe six weeks might have been six months. I can't recall that now, but it was a lengthy period. It wasn't just a week. It was where they had to reorder, restructure um, what they were doing in the church to eliminate those things that could be typically, traditionally thought of as worship. So they took music out of the whole service uh, to show that worship was more than, than music. By the end of that time, Matt had written the classic song, Heart of Worship. And just some of the lyrics go like this. I'll bring you more than a song because the song itself is not what you've required. You search much deeper within than the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship where it's all about you. It's all 
all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for this thing I made it, because it's all about you. Worship is all about Jesus. It's not about us. It's not about how high we can lift our hands, how loud we can sing, how in tune we can sing, what kind of music we can sing, how many traditional hymns we know, how many praise tunes we know. It's not about that. It's about the attitude of our heart. Because the attitude of our heart is the rudder that steers our whole life. And our life is to be worship. Our life is to be worship. Jesus told the woman at the well that you can know the one you worship. That religion is not the thing, it's relationship. Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship with the living God that you can know. It's not a place, it's a person. It's not an event, it's a lifestyle. And we can connect with the living God all the time and our worship is the way that we do that when I look at the scriptures any of us might if you've, if you've been in the scriptures for any length of time if you know anything about King David who was a shepherd King David who became king of Israel um, was the writer of most of the Psalms and those Psalms are songs a lot of them he wrote when he was a shepherd out in the field tending his sheep by day, by night, and he would write these things, and he also played the harp or the lyre, and so he was a musician. And so we do associate a lot of worship with music, but it's not the music, it's the lyrics. It's the lyrics. So as you read the Psalms, you can read how worshipful David was. David worshipped God, I think I've addressed this in here before, from the lowest lows of his life to the highest highs, because he talked to God about everything. Even his sin, even his shame, even the things he did wrong, even the things he didn't understand, he just brought it all before the Lord. He worshipped and he prayed authentically and worshipped with David's lifestyle. Turn to Acts 13.22. So if you're in John's Gospel, you're just going to go to the very next book. Chapter 13, Acts 13.22. It's, a, it's repeated from 1 Samuel 13, 14, when Samuel tells Saul, you're no longer going to be king because you flat out blew it. You got really full of yourself and you started worshiping yourself instead of God. And so God, a long time ago, when he saw that he had made a mistake in choosing you, actually started searching for somebody else. And guess what? He found this shepherd boy. Because this shepherd boy has a heart after God's own heart. And so that's repeated in Acts 13, 22, when the, the writer of Acts, it's Luke at this point, says um, that when verse 21, he talks about um, Saul being removed um, as king. And he says in verse 22, and when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will who will do all my will, who will do what I've asked him to do, who won't just get in there and get all full of himself and do what he wants to do. The the Message Bible says this, he's a man whose heart beats to my heart, a man who will do what I tell him. The English Standard Version says, a man after my own heart who will do my will. And the voice paraphrase says, a man after my own heart, he's the king of kings, He's the kind of king who will rule in ways that please me. So I want to ask you right now, are you a woman after God's own heart? Are you a woman after God's own heart who pursues the things that please God? Who lives her life in a way that pleases God? Who obeys God so that it pleases God? Even when it's something she doesn't want to do. Are you that kind of woman who says, God, more than what I want, I want what you want for me. That's pleasing to God. That's saying, I can trust her with my purposes. I can trust her with my will. David was a man after God's own heart, and he lived a life of worship. He conformed to God's will, which is always pleasing. Worship in a term, in a word, in a few words, to me is simply not holding anything back from God. 
not holding back or withholding anything from God. And God is seeking that kind of a worshiper, someone who is willing to give him her all, to open herself up and to let her life become a holy sacrifice of worship to him. God is seeking that kind of worship and that kind of worshiper. It's what he says in Jeremiah 29:13. Uh, you know Jeremiah 29:11, for I know the plans I have for you says the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you but to give you a hope and a future. And then he goes on to say and when you come to me and pray to me I will hear you in verse 13. And you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. I firmly believe that true worshipers seeking God please God and God goes after those worshipers. He seeks out our worship as we seek him. Because seeking him says that we have given him preeminence in our life. We've given him first place. We've esteemed him. We've exalted him. We've given him supreme position as the one who is worthy, as the one who is worthy. We do a lot of seeking about a lot of things. We do a lot of searching and hunting and tracking down of certain things. But the more we know of God, the more we desire to know him. Who has found that to be true? It is, it is, it's like the satisfying thing that you're never quite satisfied with. Does it make sense? Like a lot of stuff we try to satisfy our life with, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, it just is not satisfying for long. It won't, it won't hold. And we'll lose interest, we'll lose our taste for it, or we'll become addicted to it. And I've said so many times, he became my addiction, but listen, that's the thing that satisfies in a way that I, I am, have a greater capacity to want more and to need more, but only he can satisfy only he can satisfy that way. So the more we know of him, the more we want of him. So point number one on your um, session notes is this. A woman after God's own heart is a woman who worships authentically in spirit and in truth. Who worships authentically in spirit and in truth. It's just her real self. Just opens up the book of her life like this woman at the well did. And she withholds nothing. This week you're going to look at that a little closer in your life work. What are you holding back from God? God who knows you, He created you, He watches over you all the time, He knows your heart. He is the heart knower. And He knows your heart. He knows what's in it. And He's just saying, come to me and bring that to me. He knew before He ever got to the well what was in this woman's heart. And He knew the right questions to ask to get that to come out. And he's asking you questions too. Are you turning that off? Are you dressing it up? Are you, are you authentically coming to him and saying, you know what, you're right, Lord. That's an issue. That's a pain. That's a hurt. That's, that's a wound that I've just put a Band-Aid on and I need to come out to you with that. Just open up myself and let you read it. So a woman after God's own heart is a woman who worships authentically in spirit and in truth. So in spirit, that's our spirit. That's who we really are. That's our soul. That's, that's our soul man, our spirit man that connects with truth, being authentic with him, our truth, and his truth, the true truth. So I'm going to open up myself, and then I'm going to open his word and see what it has to say about that. Does that make sense? Are you tracking with that? So it's spirit and truth, and with a capital T, truth, his truth. So I'm going to be authentic and open myself up, in my deepest parts. And this is the cool thing, too. When you look at David, especially in Psalm 139 at the very end, when he says, Search me, Lord, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. David's saying, Lord, you know me better than I know myself. You know stuff that's in there that I haven't even addressed, that I am not even aware of. And so open yourself up to him and open his word and let him show you. And, you know, this is how it, it happens for me sometimes. And so I don't want you to think it's this great mystical thing where there's handwriting on the wall. Y'all, listen. Tune your ear to the shepherd's voice. Start listening by reading. Just reading. Write things down that strike you. You know when you're reading something and all of a sudden it, you get kind of a conviction of the Spirit, um, whether it's a conviction of joy or a conviction of I need to address that. But it's gentle. Because God leads us in kindness. It's a gentle conviction. 
So listen to what he's saying and let that speak to whatever you open up to him about. But talk. Have that conversation and open yourself up. Point number two is this. A woman after God's own heart is a woman who worships God alone. A woman who worships God alone. <coughs> Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. You can, you can read this later. Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. It's Isaiah's calling. Isaiah, in, in chapter 6, it, it starts out in, in an interesting way. And he says, in the year... That King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. King Uzziah was a famous king in Israel, and he was probably the rock star king, the the king that every young boy looked up to as this great military strength. He was popular. He he did more for that culture in the way of building and modernizing that culture. He had tremendous military success. Um, I won't go on about all of that, but King Uzziah was just up there. And his name, in fact, means my strength is Jehovah. And at one time, he really believed that and put his hope in that and could do nothing apart from God who gave him strength, Jehovah, who was his provider. But Uzziah got a little bit too much of himself. And he decided that since he had been such a success, he'd go into the temple and he would tell all of the priests how he was going to be worshipped and how he wanted to worship God. So he goes in and he commands these priests to let him pretty much take over. And 80 priests come and say, no, don't do, you, you're making a big mistake. Please, king, we love you. Don't do this. You're going to harm yourself. Don't do this. But he wouldn't listen and he took the sacred things in the temple, and he um, desecrated them because he made it about himself. And instantly, God struck him with leprosy. And King Uzziah spent the rest of his days as a leper and lived and died in a leper colony, shunned, outcast, segregated, and alone from all the people that he once loved and worked for and who revered him highly. Because his worship became about himself. But the interesting thing is that then Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Sometimes we've got an idol in front of us that is blocking us from seeing the Lord and that thing's got to get out of our way. And he goes on to say in Isaiah 6, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robes filled the temple. Imagine, that. get that perspective, how huge God was and God is. And he talks about the seraphim and the cherubim that circled around him saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They worshipped him. They worshipped him. And instantly, as, as Isaiah gets this picture of who God is, it gives him a great picture of who he is and who he's not. And he realizes instantly, woe to me, I am a man of unclean lips and I come from a people of unclean lips. And at that moment, uh, and woe, that word woe in the Hebrew uh, is the word oi. We hear like oi ve. That literally means to strike a blow to the, to the chest. His, his stunning realization of who he was and who he was not was almost painful to him. And he says, woe to me, I'm a man of unclean lips. God had already called him to be his spokesperson, or or God had already said he was to be, this was going to be his calling as a spokesperson for God. And so he says, at that moment I saw one of the cherubim, one of the little winged angels, flies over to the altar, and he takes a coal from underneath the altar. The altar was where the blood sacrifices were made for the atonement of sin. Apart from the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So in the Old Testament tabernacle, those um, altars were built so that the blood sacrifice was made on that altar. And then it was roasted there um, after the sacrifice was made. The priests would eat some of that. Some of it was just consumed by fire for God. So anyway, the blood from those sacrifices drips down onto those coals underneath the altar. What is it that atones for our sin? So those 
blood-saturated burning coals, the winged seraph comes and picks one up, flies over to Isaiah, and touches his mouth to sanctify his mouth for God. A mouth that probably gave a whole lot of praise to a king he had made an idol out of and worshipped in some way, but fell like every human idol will ever put up there. Because every idol we ever make for ourselves will disappoint us. We are not meant to idolize anything, nor are we to be idolized. You seek glory for yourself, you will fall because your shoulders are not equipped to handle the weight of idolatry. It's why God says, have no other gods but me alone. Have no other gods but me alone. So the seraph takes it coal and he touches Isaiah's lips. And God says immediately, who will go for us? And Isaiah, his instant response, here I am, send me. I mean, God doesn't say, all right, when your blistered lip heals, he doesn't say, when you think about what you've done and you really get your worship right, Isaiah Isaiah realized the moment he saw God and that idol was out of his way, he worshipped. He said, whoa, I have blown it here. I can't believe I have seen you, God, and I'm still alive, I'm still standing, I'm still breathing. And I am a man of unclean lips and I live around these people with unclean lips. And what does God say? Precisely. And that's why I'm going to make your lips give me praise. And I'm going to make your lips such that they speak some really hard things to the people I love. And Isaiah and Jeremiah had two of the most difficult calls on their life, speaking to the people of God about the things they were so wrong about. Some hard words. But he sanctified Isaiah's mouth and he used them anyway. Let that, let that give somebody hope in here today that whatever you've done is undone and forgiven by the one who can sanctify that. And it's usually, I say this in your, in your life with this, it's usually that thing that was formed against of us to be the undoing of us that is the precise thing God uses in our life to be one of the most powerful tools and weapons in our spiritual arsenal as part of our testimony. The thing that was meant to take you down. You put it out there and you give it to God and he redeems that. He redeems that. A woman after God's own heart is a woman who worships God alone. And he writes, said this, when we begin to glimpse the reality of God, the natural reaction is to worship him. The more we know, the more we'll worship. Point number three is this. A woman after God's own heart is a woman who worships with her whole life. Worships with her whole life. You'll unpack that a lot this week. But it's every aspect of your life. I'm going to tell you a quick story on this. There was a Scottish Olympic runner in the early 1900s named Eric Little, L-I-D-D-E-L-L. Have you ever heard of him? If you saw the movie Chariots of Fire, it's about his life. Eric Little's family were um, strong believers, and they were missionaries in China. His parents were there. His sister and brother had gone back, and he was poised to go there. Eric had a little... um, little fun thing he just loved doing and it was running and he could run like the wind. He ran and he ran and he ran fast and some people in town started clocking him and saying, hey, there's this thing that's going to happen, these games, these Olympic games and we think you could go and run. No, no, no. I'm not a runner. But they kept persisting and they would put him up against other people and they found that this guy is quick and he's fast and he's consistent. And so they said, we want you to go to these games and represent Scotland. Well, his sister came to him and said, Eric, Eric, you're not a runner. You, you're not an athlete. You can't, you can't do this. You're meant for the mission field. And he said, ah, I was meant for the mission field. And I will go to China. I will go to the mission field. So he says, sister, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. What is it that when you do it, you feel God's pleasure? Maybe it's cooking, raising your children, playing with your children, serving the homeless. Maybe it's the work you do. Maybe you're a computer programmer. Maybe you work in some um, realm of finance or accounting. 
Maybe you paint. Maybe you have a hobby you love, and that when you do it, you feel God's pleasure. You know, that's worship. When you didn't shift your focus to it's not just about me, it's about Him. I'm going to paint to His glory. I'm going to bounce these books to His glory. I'm going to raise these children to His glory. I'm going to sing to His glory. I'm going to paint. I'm going to do whatever it is. I'm going to cook this meal to His glory. You don't even have to be a great cook, but if you just serve up a meal and and just thank God throughout. I have the ability to do this and I have the means to prepare this. And just you give God glory in your everyday life. That's worship. That's a lifestyle of worship. Romans 12, 1 and 2, you'll unpack that this week. And we talked a little bit about it last week. Um, Paul talks about um, taking our life and offering it as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your act of worship to him an act of worship that pleases him. And then he goes on to say, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so um, we are the sacrifice he's looking for. We are the sacrifice. He's, He's saying, you're the one I want on the altar. I want your whole life. Give me your whole life as an act of worship and watch what I can do through it. So that's point number three. That a woman, after God's own heart, is a woman who worships with her whole life. Point number four. We can have secrets with God, but worshiping in spirit and truth demands that we keep no secrets from God. We can have secrets with God, but worshiping in spirit and truth demands that we keep no secrets from God. He can handle our secrets. He can handle that. Um, Exodus 29:37. Tur- turn back there with me to the very front of the Bible, um, just after Genesis. Exodus 29. I'm just going to read this very quickly to you, if you can find it. Exodus 29, verse 37. This is in the building of the Old Testament tabernacle in the wilderness. So the first temple that God was worshipped in was actually a portable tabernacle in the wilderness. And um, God gave Moses very specific, detailed instructions on what was to be done, how it was to be done, and what it was to be used for. And here's where he talks about the altar. He says, verse 37, For seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it. It means set it apart to make it holy. Consecrate it. Um, it's, It's designated as holy. Consecrate the altar after seven days and the altar shall be most holy. Everybody say, the altar shall be most holy. What shall be most holy? The altar. And then he goes on to say, whatever touches the altar becomes holy. What becomes holy? What becomes holy? Touches what? Whatever touches the altar becomes holy. Whatever touches the altar, because the altar is holy. Okay, so here, let's unpack this a little bit. Whatever touches the altar becomes holy. Whatever I put on that altar becomes a holy sacrifice to the Lord. Now, sacrifice is a slaying, is a killing, is a death, right? So I'm not at all saying, you put that thing, that selfish desire and that sin on his altar and he makes it holy and now you can do it. That's not what that means. It's a sacrifice. It's an altar of sacrifice. It's an altar of sacrifice that he says, you put that there and I'm going to make it holy. I'm going to redeem it so that now can be used for my purposes as you serve me. As you serve me. Um, Exodus, let me just find this one thing. Exodus um, 20, 24 He talks about, and you can just mark that down, he talks about sacrificing your whole burnt offering, your peace offering, and every place that I cause my name to be honored in your worship, I'll hire myself be and bless you. So here's the thing. we got to put some things on that altar that just need to be burned. What is it in your life that just needs to be burned up, time to burn it up, those secrets, whatever it is, that shame... It's just time to let it get burned up. Your peace offering. Some of these things we're holding on to need to just be let loose on the altar so that we can receive some peace. Let go of those things, put them on the altar, 
and get some peace. We're trying to control too many things. We're holding on to resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness. Let it go and get some peace. Make it a peace offering. A relationship you're struggling with. Put it on that altar. Let him deal with it. It becomes a holy act of worship and sacrifice to him. Every place where I cause my name to be honored in your worship, I'll bear myself. Bless you. Whatever you do in putting that down on that altar, he will bless you. He will write his name over it so that it can then be used as a part of your testimony. No longer a part of your life and controlling your life, but a part of your testimony. Does that make sense? And so he doesn't bless it so that you can have it back. He blesses it because now it becomes purposed for him. Remember Isaiah. Did he, did he sanctify Isaiah's lips or bless Isaiah's lips so he could go on talking about Uzziah who was dead? No, he sanctified his lips. The thing where the uncleanliness came out of so that he could use that mouth then to give glory to him. Does that make sense? It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing he does. Because the fact is, we've got a past. He doesn't erase it. He repurposes it. He doesn't erase it. He redeems it. He buys it back and exchanges it for something of more value. That's what redeem means. He takes it. He buys it back. He repurposes it and exchanges it for something of greater value, of greater worth, not to us, to him. David says he lifted me up out of that pit. He established me in a firm place. Then he put a new song in my mouth. A song of praise so that now I sing and people come to know him. Now I'm singing for his glory and people come to know him. And David was a singer. He was a musician. God says he desires truth in our innermost parts. Psalm 51, 6. He desires truth on the inside. Honesty and integrity on the inside, he wants us to be open and clean and up front with him about what's going on. It's just a good detox, y'all. Just constantly, continually be in that place of just getting it all up and out before him. Keep short accounts with the Lord. Keep short accounts with him. Point number five, a woman after God's own heart brings it all before God. Brings it all before God. In John 14, 16, Jesus says, Go call your husband and come back here. Go call your husband. And and then she opens it up. She brings it all out. Well, I don't have a husband. And he says, right, let me finish this for you. You don't have a husband. You're living with a man right now. And you've had five husbands before him. It's been a mess. It's been a heartache. It's been a heartbreak. I'm sure there's shame. I'm sure there's hurt, confusion, doubt. And I bet you there's anger in there, too. But go call him and come back. Notice that he didn't say, go, go get your husband, work it out, and I'll, and I'll see you later. He said, go call your husband and come back. See, Jesus knows what's going on with this, and he says, go get me that thing, go call that thing, go breathe that thing, but you come back here. I've got more for you. You come back. Go call your alienated child. Go call that unforgiven person who betrayed you. Go, go call the spouse you've neglected. Go call the employer you've cheated. Go call the friend you've gossiped about. Go call the dead parent you're still bitter toward and trying to please and come back here with it and bring it to me. Go and come back with your self-centeredness and your self-pity. Go and come back with your jealousy and your anger and your envy. Go and come back with your pride and your selfish ambition. Go and come back with your guilt and shame. Go and come back with your critical spirit and your insecurity. Go and come back with your worry and your fear and your overwhelming unbelief that I can do for you exactly what I say I can do for you and I can be to you exactly who I said I can be to you, that I can be your everything. Go! Get it all and come back to the well. Come back to me and lay it all down and let's talk it all through. Jesus came to urge sinners. It says in in Matthew 9.13, urge sinners, not the self-righteous, but to urge sinners back to God. He's not 
mad at you. He's not shaking his head over you. He will never stand there as you pour your heart out and his jaw will not hit the floor. He will not suck wind. His eyes will not quadruple in size. He will never gasp. His head will never go into his hands. He will never push his hair back and shake his head at you. He never will. He'll never scoff at you or roll his eyes at you. He loves you. And here's what he says. I'll never love you any more, any less than I love you right now. But I love you too much for you to be carrying around that stuff. And I'm telling you, if you give it to me, I'll receive it as worship. You get it and you seek me out and you come back here with it and I'll take it and we'll lay it down here together. Come on, we'll do it together. We'll just lay it down here together. And you leave it there. And actually, you crawl up. Actually, you crawl up here with it. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put my name over it, and I'm gonna bless it. And then I'm gonna pick you up, and I'm gonna stand you up, and I'm gonna dust you off, and I'm gonna make your feet and your ankles and your knees and your legs so strong and secure in that groundedness of faith. And then I'm gonna do something crazy. I'm gonna put a song in your mouth. I know you say you can't sing, but when you say what you say, it's a song to my ears. When you tell people what I've done for you, it is music to my ears. Because I know, I know that you love me. And I know that you could have never gotten there had you not sought me and had I not been seeking you. And baby, I've been seeking you your whole life. Your whole life. Your whole beautiful life. So go and come back and keep going and coming back and going and and that's the beauty. He never leaves us. He's always there. But he only says go if it's to bring something back to him that he needs to deal with. Amen? Do we love him? And we just want to love him more. Lord God, we do. We just want to love you more than anything and anyone and desire nothing on this earth as much or more than we desire you. Make it so, Lord. Let us love you more today than we did yesterday and more tomorrow than we do today. God, open our hearts and speak to us. Even now as we go hear Richard preach your word, speak to us, Lord. Let something Richard says today underscore what we've heard today in our heart from you. And it may be something totally unique from, to, to each, and every person, each and every person in this room. Because I firmly believe your word goes out. It goes out. And it does not return void, but accomplishes the purpose for which you sent it. And I think that Richard's words today that are scripture from your word will go out and accomplish a unique purpose in every individual's life in that room to accomplish only what you deem needs to be accomplished. So, Lord, we ask you now, come and accomplish something in our lives today for your glory, for your sake. And in the strong and saving name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. And glory. Hallelujah. Okay. We'll see you next week. Amen.